Hey guys, it's Ewan with The Air Zoo. In a previous interview, I chatted with author Nell McShane Wolfhart about her book, The Great Stewardess Rebellion, how women launched a workplace revolution at 30,000 feet. The book, which is available at the Air Zoo's flyby gift store, tells the incredible stories of the women who stood up against the huge airlines and won. To learn more about the current working conditions of flight attendants, I am joined by Sarah Nelson, the International President of the Associations of Flight Attendants, CWA. Hello, Sarah. Hi, great to be here, Ewan. Yeah, and I think let's let's get cracking with one of the big questions. In our book, The Great Stewardess Rebellion, Nell um, describes the 1960s airplane cabin as one of the most sexist workplaces in America. Is that still true today? Well, you know, I, I'm very thankful for the Me Too movement uh, because flight attendants built up this career. We never believed that anyone would ever do anything for us. We fought for uh, flight attendant certification uh, so that we had the, re the federal requirement of being on those planes. Uh, we also won that in the 1950s, the minimum requirement of staffing those planes. Um, but we always had to fight for every single thing on our own. We never believed that anyone would take that seriously. When I was president, when the Me Too movement broke, and I said to my staff, get ready, phone's going to start ringing off the hook. And they said, what do you mean? And I said, well, um, the media is going to say we need some stories about workplace sexual harassment. And who are they going to think to call? They're going to call the flight attendants. Um, and so actually, I have to say that we, we launched a survey. I got into the crew rooms talking to flight attendants. I'm a 27-year union flight attendant. I know the sexism myself. I can tell plenty of um, awful stories myself about it. Um, but I wanted to make sure that my experience was actually what other people were experiencing. And what really stuck with me at the time was that not only did our survey results find that 70% of flight attendants had experienced sexual harassment in the prior year, and one in five flight attendants had actually experienced physical um, assault or sexual harassment uh, in the workplace, um, but also that people didn't talk about it. Only 7% of those actually reported, and only half of those would have recommended to someone else to report this issue to the company. I know in my experience, when I started flying, uh, I, I had a man come up behind me uh, as I was setting up the galley before we took off. He rubbed up and down around my rear end and my hip um, and almost, almost cupped my rear end and said, what, no girdle? How do you look this good in a uniform without a girdle? And, um, you know, I was shocked, first of all, um, but also it never occurred to me to report it. Uh, I told the rest of my flying partners so that they could avoid him uh, and keep themselves safe during the flight. But no one ever talked about this. Uh, and there was never there was never a workplace dialogue about it. it. When I got into those crew rooms at the end of the conversations, I would say, and what happens when these things happen to you? What do you do? And flight attendants would say, well, you know, we tell them to stop. We tell them blah, 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 blah. And I said, every time. And they said, actually, no, um, because our job is to de-escalate. We've got a lot of duties. We have to keep moving through the plane. And also, you know, nobody cared. And um, to a T, whether they had been flying for six months or 30 years, they said, um, we just started to understand that it was part of the job. And that broke my heart. <laughs> um, and we wrote to the CEOs of the industry and asked them to do three things, um, to denounce the industry's sexist past, to lift up flight attendants as first responders and safety professionals, not as sex objects, and to declare that there was zero tolerance for this activity in our workplace. And so I know that it has gotten better because some of the CEOs did that and because there's been so much dialogue around it. Um, but flight attendants still face this today, absolutely. And because the job has been sexualized, it's men and women who face uh, that objectification. And we're still fighting through that. Yeah, I, th I think I think it's very interesting you say about the job still being very sexualized because that was one of the, one of the shocking things about the, the book, you know, was the history of flight attendants being put um, forward, not as industry professionals, not as people who are there for passenger safety, but rather as temporary girlfriends, essentially, who are there to kind of daughter on you, look after you, um, and, you know, um, be there for all your kind of needs. Um, you said you had, you know, you're 27 years in the industry. Do you want to talk just briefly about how, how did you, you know, first get into the industry? And, and what was that like? Yeah, so I 
never imagined that I would be a flight attendant. I had no idea what that meant. I didn't know what it meant to be a part of the aviation industry. I went to school to become a uh, high school English teacher. And while I was doing my student teaching after we had graduated from college, I did that in the fall, uh, my best friend from college became a flight attendant. Uh, it was it was just, um, it was a happenstance. Uh, she was house sitting for someone in our senior year and they were a family of United uh, employees and they were taking their kids on a worldwide tour and they said, United Airlines is hiring, you should go become a flight attendant. Well, uh, nine months later, she was a flight attendant. She had been working for about four months. She called me one very snowy day in St. Louis when I was working four different jobs uh, to try to make ends meet, make rent and start to pay off the student loans that, uh, that were coming my way uh, and get ready to set up my classroom in the fall. And I was already dead tired. And she called and razzed me that her feet were in the sand in Miami Beach and United Airlines was paying for it. And, um, but then she went on to say, no, that actually, you know, we joked about this, but this job is no joke. And she went on to describe what our union had negotiated uh, over 60 years at that time. Um, and she talked about the pay, which was going to be higher than my first year teacher pay. She talked about the flexibility and the, uh, the ability to own our time. She talked about the healthcare and the pension. And the pension is what made me get in the car and drive to Chicago the next day to interview with United Airlines because I hear I was 23 and already exhausted. And the idea of taking a pension at age 50 and possibly having another career after that sounded really good. Um, so that's how I started flying. Um, but uh, then I got to Boston uh, where I was sent to be based. And it's an incredibly expensive city to live in. This is uh, very typical for flight attendants. We work out of these expensive cities and have to make ends meet. And uh, I was waiting for that first paycheck. I got a, an apartment with seven other women and my paycheck didn't come and no one at the company was helping me. And when I couldn't get any answers or any help in the office, it was a flight attendant who tapped on my shoulder when I was in a moment of desperation. And I had never met her before. She looked a lot like me wearing the same uniform. I remember her union pin shining above her wings and she was holding her checkbook. She asked me how to spell my name. She wrote me a check for $800 and she said, number one, you go take care of yourself. And number two, you call our union. And I did call our union. I have my paycheck the next day, but I always tell people that I learned everything I needed to know about our union in that moment when she was standing in front of me because um, through our union, we can do things that we can never do on our own. We can look out for each other, make the most out of the care that we have for each other, and, um, and actually fight forward in a way that's impossible when you're just a number at these big companies. Um, so that's really what got me involved. And, and when, after I called the union to ask for help, they called me back and asked me if I wanted to help out and do the new hire presentation so that no one else would have to face what I went through. And uh, I was so honored they were asking me. I had no idea people said no. <laughs> and I uh, spent a lot of off hours in those early years um, committing time uh, to our union and to helping other flight attendants. Yeah, your story very much aligns with the, some of the stories that are in the book. You know, um, women who weren't going in to be a labor organizer or whatever, who just, you know, face a slight un injustice and then all of a sudden they're president, you know, um, <laughs> it just, it just happens. Um, but obviously, yeah. The, why, why do you think it's so important for flight attendants specifically to be a unionized uh, workforce? Well, to be clear, I do think that anyone working uh, needs a union. But flight attendants, we are, we are working in a, um, in a, a very safety sensitive job. And um, a lot of the safety re regulations that exist today are because of our union. Uh, the Making sure that there is flame retardant uh, carpet on the planes, <laughs> making sure that our uniforms are not the first to burn up, uh, making sure that there's no pesticides sprayed in the, in the plane, poisoning people and working on other air quality issues. Um, beating back for the first time against big tobacco. Uh, we won the, the first battle against them, getting smoking out of our workplace. We wouldn't have any of these things if it wasn't for our union. We wouldn't have that flight attendant certification that I was talking about. We wouldn't have the requirement of flight attendants to be on the plane. Um, that's certainly job security, but it's also, we're there for a reason. We're there for the safety, health, and security of the passengers and the other crew members in our care. And we have you know serious roles to perform and flight attendants save lives every day. Um, but when things really go down, um, they, uh, they have been heroes. And, um, 
we were trained for that. We, I, there's a U.S. Airways flight that landed and um, many of the passengers died. The plane was, was on fire and a flight attendant who had broken his ankle in the process returned to the aircraft several times to carry other passengers out to safety. Um, and so when, when you do that kind of work and you're there alone, it's a, it's a virtually unsupervised work space where we're flying uh, to all these cities that we're not familiar with. And we have to have hotel rooms that are safe, clean, and quiet so that we can get rest and we can get food between our flights. None of those issues would have been addressed if it hadn't been for our union. So I can't even imagine what it would be like to go to work in this job uh, without that union pin on and without the backing of our union and our union contract. Yeah, among the among United American and Southwest, I think around about 80% of the workers are unionized. But at Delta, that number is about, I think, 20%. So why is Delta so unorganized? And what what's your union doing to change that? So the, most of the flight attendant organizing took place in the 1940s, most of the, of, of the legacy carriers, the carriers that have been around that long. Um, and most of the pilot organizing happened in the 1930s. So the pilot organizing happened first, and it happened virtually across the rest of the industry. Um, Delta Airlines took a very aggressive pro approach in the 1940s against that organizing that was going on. Um, they, they really used to their advantage all of the discriminatory practices that were in place with our career, um, the, the churn, the, the massive attrition of flight attendants, but also the geographical um, social standards that were in place. They really played up uh, the Southern um, narrative and uh, worked very hard at keeping that union off the property. So Delta has never been organized. When they merged with Northwest Air Airlines, Northwest was one third the size of Delta. Uh, we had an election at that time. Uh, Delta pulled out all the stops to try to keep the union off the property. And by the narrowest of margins, a, a swing of 150 votes out of 20,000 votes cast, um, the Northwest flight attendants lost their contract and lost their union overnight. And Delta is unorganized today. Today, there's 27,000 Delta flight attendants. Um, many of them have been hired just in the last five years alone. These are people who are very conscious about the union organizing that's happening all over the country. Uh, Delta doesn't have the same uh, sort of hold on people that they used to have with the um, geographical narrative and all of the discriminatory practices. So we're seeing uh, a lot of people come right out of training who want to form a union. And we're helping Delta flight attendants form that union. It's a big job though, because under the Railway Labor Act, you have to uh, get more than 50% of the workforce to sign a physical card within 12 months in order to qualify for that election. And we don't get the contact information. So out of those 27,000 people, there's 8,000 flight attendants we don't even have contact information for. So imagine a mobile workforce that you're trying to organize and track down and get them to sign these physical cards over the course of 12 months. It's quite a job, um, but they're off to the races. And I think we're going to get it done this time. That's, that's, that's exciting to hear. That's a, it'll be a, a massive, uh, massive get uh, if, you, if you manage to get that done. Um, going back a couple of year, years, 2019, um, you specifically called for a, a general strike to, to help end the government shutdown. Uh, why did you kind of decide on that that very, at the time, unique call? You know, it was it was a it was a call that a lot of people hadn't heard in decades. So why uh, was that the moment to kind of bring that idea back? Well, I actually believe that the labor movement should be setting the agenda for the country, and um, the, because th this is supposed to be about the people. <laughs> of the people, by the people, for the people. Um, and um, we, we've never really fulfilled that promise. And so uh, we, we need to set the agenda. And I, I went into 2019 with, with that attitude, certainly. Um, but when we were facing the longest government shutdown uh, in our history, and our union was very aware of the stress and strain on uh, the government structures that are in place that make our industry run, and we can't, run, we can't do our jobs without. Um, we were we were always very concerned whenever there was a shutdown. So we were engaged right away uh, with the rest of the industry, engaged with the uh, federal workers who were either out of work or forced to come to work without pay. We're talking about nearly a million workers, by the way, federal workers, and another million contract workers. Um, this was only a partial government shutdown in 2019. 
Uh, but we were heading into 30 days of shutdown, which was already almost twice as long as any other government shutdown in history. And as, as that shutdown goes on, we're taught in a safety sensitive role that the first rule in safety is to leave all, distraction be, all distractions behind. Do not allow yourself to be distracted. Well, what could be more distracting than not getting a paycheck and not knowing if you're gonna be able to provide for your family and having to drive Uber when you're an air traffic controller between shifts so that you can make your mortgage payment, um, but not getting the sleep that you need um, to be 100% on the job. Because if air traffic controllers are not 100% on their job, that means a major aircraft accident. Um, and so we can't allow for that. The system was being stretched so far. So not only did we have 2 million people who were out of work or forced to come to work without pay, but the people that I represent were going to work in a workspace that was increasingly unsafe. It was increasingly unsafe for the entire country. And we knew that very well. We had been through 9-11. We could talk about the importance of having the TSA working with all of the functions in the background. The, the Homeland Security, Cybersecurity Unit, 40% of people were just furloughed. Um, there is so much work that happens with safety and security and so much background work that is done to help the entire network work that when you, when you pull those strings apart, uh, the netting starts to stretch and you can full, fall through those holes. And what that means, we know very well what it means when the planes stop and when, when people lose their lives. And so we were fighting with that kind of urgency and we were getting ready to strike ourselves as a union. What I said to the labor movement uh, when I was receiving an award uh, at the MLK um, uh, uh, function uh, for, from the AFL-CIO uh, was go back to your unions and talk about the fierce urgency of now, uh, as um, MLK used to say, and talk about uh, striking and a general strike. We can take control. We can end the shutdown. And setting that narrative, when the flights started to cancel, um, there was a real concern that workers were actually going to get a real taste of our power. And when there had been no solution in 35 days, within a couple of hours, suddenly there was one. Um, and that was because we not only defined the very serious problem before us, we set our demands, open the government. We put those demands on directly on Mitch McConnell, the person who um, could get that done um, and shifted it away from the White House, which is where they were trying to put the spotlight. And uh, we backed that up with what we were willing to do. And so our union was getting ready to strike and we were very clear about that, but we were calling on everyone else to join us because we should be setting that agenda. We should be setting that tone and we should be responsible for our fellow workers. I also couldn't help but think about uh, 1981 when Ronald Reagan fired all the air traffic controllers and that this was our PATCO moment. Uh, the rest of the labor movement did not rush to the aid of the air traffic controllers at that time. And our world would be completely different, I believe, if we had. What that set in motion was a tone to all the companies across the country um, and around the world uh, that it's open season on unions, that you want to draw unions into strikes and try to um, try to get rid of certification, try to break the union. And they did that very successfully. And there was a steep decline in union membership in this country. And at the same time, inequality shot through the roof. Our productivity went through the roof. Our wages remained flat and all of that productivity went into the hands of Wall Street instead of reinvesting in our communities and in the companies and in the people um, who, as you know, Henry Ford said, you gotta pay people enough to buy the product that they're making. Um, and so we, um, we, we wanted to set the tone here and we wanted to, we wanted to sort of atone for um, what had not happened during PATCO and the very, um, the very slippery slope that we laid out ourselves for labor, not understanding that an injury to one is an injury to all. The federal workers were in there fighting and they could have been sent to jail if they had walked off the job. Um, the, this was not their moment to try to do this for us. We had to rush to their aid. Yeah, a lot of people credit that call for a general strike as it being the moment that really helped end the shutdown. With a potential another shutdown on the horizon, are we going to see a similar call again? So we'll do what we have to do. I mean, I, I, it's very important for people to understand that we were watching the system very closely and we were very close to saying it is unsafe to go to work. Um, that would have been in the next couple of days if that shutdown had not ended. 
what has happened since then is simply an extension of funding. So no real um, effort to try to rehire air traffic controllers, no real effort to hire other inspectors at the FAA. The system is stretched even more than it was in 2019. This time, it's not gonna be 34, 35 days before we get to a place where we have to say it's unsafe. It's unsafe to go to work. Um, it's, it's gonna be a lot sooner. Uh, but that's that's where our power lies. That's what we're going to be looking out for. And of course, just like every day when we go to work, if we see something wrong with the plane or uh, wrong with the setup of getting everyone on board safely, we are we're not going to fly that plane. It's our lives on the line, too. So we're going to take the same stand if we have to and um, uh, take control and make sure that the government, uh, that the representatives are doing what they're supposed to be doing to keep our country running. Um, the last couple of days or so, the UAW president, Sean Fain, he recently said he had this great idea. He had this idea where he's hoping to change the end of the contract expirations to kind of coincide with May Day. Is that something your union would join with? Well, the yes. Let me just say that, first of all. I was in Detroit with Sean Fain yesterday. Um, it's brilliant. We've been talking about that actually for a couple months. Um, the symbolism of putting that on May Day, too. Um, which was the original Labor Day, um, celebrated first in the United States around fighting for the eight-hour day. Um, and by the way, we have to put on that fight again. Our time is not our own. Um, so we're back in the same place. Yeah, workers need to fight together. Um, the May Day is still celebrated around the rest of the world, even though um, it was first celebrated in the United States. It's still ce celebrated around uh, the world as workers, uh, as, as the Workers' Labor Day. Uh, celebration. And it moved to September when uh, Grover Cleveland broke the railroad strike and um, sent out the militia to send people back to work and to sort of appease labor and not have other unions rush to their side, announced that he was setting the federal holiday of Labor Day, but moved it away uh, from the solidarity with workers around the rest of the world. So, um, you know, what Sean Fain is setting up here is very exciting. Uh, we certainly are all in on that. The only difference is that we work under the Railway Labor Act where contracts don't expire, they become amendable. So it doesn't have quite the same meaning, uh, meaning or impact. Um, but we're, we're absolutely going to think about how we can set it up so that we can be in a place where we are credibly uh, threatening a strike and getting to that moment around that same time, it, May 1st, uh, uh, 2028. It's very exciting for the labor movement right now in the United States. Um, obviously, one of the biggest labor issues probably in the country's history was a couple of years ago with COVID-19. And that deeply, deeply in fact, you know, uh, impacted the, the aviation industry. So how did COVID-19 um, impact flight attendants and how did the industry and the unions ensure that, you know, people could still be employed? So after having gone through 9-11 and I personally went through 9-11. It was uh, United Airlines Flight 175 uh, crashed into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. And you know exactly which flight I'm talking about because it was captured by cameras trained on that site from every angle because American Flight 11 had crashed into the North Tower 17 minutes earlier. And those were my friends. That was the flight that I worked all the time. But it was also uh, a time that any flight attendant could relate um, to what happened there. And as we were grieving, what we didn't know was that crisis capitalists were planning right away to redefine the value of our jobs. And they used that moment to take us into bankruptcies and strip uh, all those provisions in the contract that I talked about originally, made me get in the car and drive to Chicago um, to come do this job. And so we saw this crisis coming and I was not about to allow that to happen again because negotiating in bankruptcy is like negotiating with a gun to your head. And I knew that there was a very good likelihood that many airlines may go out of business um, or shed thousands and thousands of jobs. Um, this was a bigger crisis than 9-11. Uh, the demand for air travel dropped by 97%. Uh, there was no flying to do uh, unless it was essential flying to move um, healthcare personnel and um, goods around uh, the country and around the world. So 
um, we, we set about putting together a plan that was a workers first plan, uh, a relief package that for the first time would tell the airlines, tell any corporation actually, exactly what they had to do with the money. And we put together this plan with strict requirements that there had to be a cap on executive pay, a ban on stock buybacks and dividends. Uh, we also had some other demands in there, uh, worker seats on the company boards. Uh, we said that the um, that the money could not be spent on any kind of union busting, that the, the airlines just simply had to follow uh, the law on that. There's no enforcement today, but that that is the law, that they're not supposed to interfere with workers' free right to decide to join a union or not. And um, we didn't get everything that we wanted, but uh, we, we won because when the airlines were trying to get a package, a relief package through, they were, they were getting the cold shoulder from Congress. And so uh, Chairman DeFazio, who had gotten approval from Nancy Pelosi to make our plan, the core uh, plan for the Democrats and the core plan in the House, said to the airlines, I'm not going to talk to you until you talk to labor. And they said, should we call Rich Trumka, the president of the AFL-CIO? And he said, no, call Sarah Nelson. She's got the plan. You need to talk to her. And they did call. And um, on March 18th of 2020, I went down to Airlines for America, met with five of the major airline CEOs, and uh, I told them, I said, you're not going to get what you want. Um, the public hates you. Uh, you've been squeezing people into seats that are smaller and smaller. People are feeling the impact of, the, of inequality in their own lives when they walk onto your planes. Um, you're going to have to come to our plan. And the benefit of that, too, is that you're going to keep people qualified in their jobs because we'll keep the paychecks going, which means that you won't have to sever people from employment, which means that you don't have to redo security checks, you don't have to redo qualifications, and we can start up again when the demand comes back. So they came to our plan, and like I said, we didn't get everything that we wanted, but the, ma but the main portion of that, uh, sending that money directly to workers' paychecks, requiring no furloughs of any of the airline workers, and um, also capping executive compensation uh, two years after the relief period ended, and uh, stock buybacks a year after the, after the relief period ended, all of those things were components of the payroll support program that was passed by Congress and then re-upped two more times to ensure that ultimately we didn't have anyone out of work. There was a, a short lapse um, when Congress didn't refund that in Octo uh, October 1st of 2020, um, but by the end of December, before people's health care was cut off, um, which was extended through their contract, through their union contract, um, we got them back to work. Um, and got them fully restored to their jobs. So um, it's a huge success story. We won uh, $54 billion for workers. Um, it's the first workers first package ever. And it made it possible for the US airline industry to restart. Um, I know that there were a lot of fits and starts, but let's be clear, when you bring the whole thing down and try to bring it back up again, you're gonna have some issues. But if you compare it to what happened around the rest of the world, no one else was ready to come back. And the U.S. airline industry was and was able to respond. It's, it's viewed around the world as the most successful pro relief program um, in all of COVID. With the industry now bouncing back from COVID, um, what, what are the current issues that flight attendants are facing right now? What are, what are the things they're fighting for? Yeah, so we are, we are finally in a place where we are able to fight uh, forward in our careers. We, we had just been getting to that place where we were really hitting our stride and 9-11 happened. And since that time, it was all the airline bankruptcies and then the consolidation where they pitted workers against each other. And like I said, got rid of one of the union contracts in the Delta Northwest merger. Um, and so if you look at worker pay and benefits, uh, flight attendants and other aviation workers, our, our pay and benefits were essentially flat from 9-11. We had just barely crawled back if adjusted for inflation um, to right where we were uh, before 9-11. So in 2020, we were all going into contract bargaining and that really got, COVID put that on hold. But right now, um, uh, all, the flight, all the pilots, except for the Southwest pilots have their new contracts and the flight attendants are at the table right now and it's coming to a head. American Airlines flight attendants just took a 99.5% strike vote uh, Alaska flight attendants are taking a strike vote very soon, and United flight attendants are not very far behind them. And what we're what we're demanding is that our time is respected with pay for all the time, all of our time at work. 
since the 1940s when we first um, organized and when we first got our contract. Our pay was based on the pilot contract, which only paid uh, for when the airplane was away from the gate and in the air. So only those flight hours. And uh, we've done a lot of things to try to make sure that those flight hours are paid, that there's formulas that require for your time away on the job, your time on duty during a day will actually create a formula that ensures that you get those flight hours paid more often. Usually what that means is that the airlines are just more efficient with scheduling our time uh, so that they're not paying uh, for work that's not accomplished. But um, it, we, we are not paid, for example, during the time that passengers are coming on board our plane. And it's oftentimes the most stressful part of our job. Um, the other thing that uh, is a huge issue for flight attendants today is that staffing is at minimums and our planes are full every single day. So those, the, the boarding scenario actually becomes much more stressful. And we're not just fighting for boarding pay, actually. We're fighting for ground time pay um, to be paid for all of that duty time and the time that you have to stay at the airport and wait for your next flight in between there. That's, that's uh, time that flight attendants are on the job away from their families um, that they're not getting paid for today. So that's a huge demand in these contracts in uh, negotiations. And we want to make sure that Healthcare costs are not uh, shifted more uh, to employees. Unfortunately, this, this is an issue that we have to take on as an entire labor movement. We need healthcare for all. We need to be like Canada. When I talk to my union siblings up there, they don't spend as much time at the bargaining table because they don't have to talk about healthcare. And it's something that's provided for everyone. Um, but until we get to that place, we need to make sure that those costs, increased costs in healthcare are not shifted more to the employees. And we need to make sure that there's a secure retirement. Our pensions were terminated across the board. I'm about to go to the White House um, today for the rollout of the fiduciary rule, which will make sure that financial planners are required to give good advice to their clients. This is a huge deal because our members today have their retirements in 401ks. And if you have financial advisors who are able to um, shift people into uh, financial planning that is good for them because they're getting a kickback, what uh, we've shown across the country is that retirees have lost up to 20% of their retirement. Um, so we're, we're doing that at the White House while we're at the bargaining table trying to increase those contributions and make that retirement more secure for flight attendants. Um, these are the major demands on the table. Um, in addition to, of course, not just getting paid for all of our time at work, but demands that look a lot like the auto workers um, at the, those size of demands, because that's what we need to catch up and actually move forward. And final question from me, what can we do as passengers? What can we do to make flight attendants workplaces better? Um, so we've had a really combative uh, space on the job in recent years, and those full airplanes don't make it any better. But what we find is that the vast majority of passengers who come to our plane um, come with kindness in their heart and a desire for a safe, uneventful flight. So the, the biggest thing that I would say is don't let the bad apples ruin your flying experience. And you can do some very simple things to make sure that that doesn't happen. When you board the plane, put your phone down, make eye contact with the flight attendant, say hello, let them know that if, if there's a tr trouble on board, we know who we can go to. Be a good witness. Let us know when things are happening. We're trained in de-escalation. If we can get to the issues faster um, because you alert us, uh, it's very likely that we're gonna be more successful in de-escalating and making sure that your flight stays on time uh, and getting to uh, where it needs to go and making sure that it doesn't erupt uh, in violence on the plane where people can't get away. Um, and so all of these issues really, when people are, are stepping up and saying thank you and recognizing us as human beings and that we're all in this together, that makes a huge difference on the job. And in addition to that, I would just say, you know, support us the way that the public supported the auto workers because we're trying to raise the standards uh, for this job and set a new tone for workers across the industry that we create all of the value in the economy and we should be able to share in it. Um, and so those three things would be very helpful. Well, thank you very much for uh, spending some time with us today, Sarah. Um, best of luck with all your future union campaigns, and I'll let you get to the White House. <laughs> thank you. All right. Take care, everyone.